Let's get the show started. Uh, my name is Alexey Krabrov. Uh, I'm the director of open source science community at IBM. And um, open source science is a new initiative that we started last year. It brings together open source developers and scientists, right? So IBM Research is one of the most established industry research organizations. We have fundamental research going, you know, decades back in material science, healthcare. And so the way we set it up is basically a lot of scientists are using open source tools, right, to do scientific discovery. And uh, we established this uh, at NumFocus. NumFocus is a per sister organization to Linux Foundation. It's a foundation for Python, mostly Python data science stack, right? So who here heard about Jupyter? Yes. Who heard about Pandas? And who heard about NumFocus? Somebody, right? So NumFocus basically least known, you know, oldest foundation. It's a 10 year old organization, which basically is a home to NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Jupyter, Scikit-Learn. Everybody knows these names. Nobody knows NumFocus. Linux Foundation is doing a much better job at marketing itself. Uh, so, and, uh, but we basically work with everyone. So open source science is at NumFocus, right? But obviously, uh, we as IBM support that. Also, as IBM, we are members of Linux Foundation on AI and data, PyTorch Foundation, and IBM basically was instrumental in creation of Linux Foundation. So we're very happy, right, to bring together open source community to bear on science. And uh, how this event came together, obviously, uh, scientists use uh, everything to accelerate their research, right? So when uh, large language models burst onto the scene, uh, we actually, I remember this, we were at, you know, at New Rips, right? And IBM had a massive booth as well as many other companies. And during Jeff Hinton's keynote, so Jeff Hinton received Lifetime Achievement Award, right, for deep learning. And during Jeff Hinton's keynote, uh, chat GPT announcement came. And I think it was really amazing, right? Like it was the biggest disruption, uh, I think, in the field in many, many years. And obviously everybody started playing with this and uh, at IBM Research folks looked at what are the implications of this for science and kind of fundamental research we do. And uh, at this point, there is a lot of work in areas which are not typically discussed uh, in kind of popular context. So we have a lot of geospatial research, right? So we have a lot of geospatial data, we have climate data, we have you know, satellite imagery. So uh, we have a team which works on f fundamental questions of uh, um, geospatial data and they apply LLMs to geospatial data. Uh, we also have teams which work in material science, and that spans carbon capture materials, right, to arrest climate change. Also, that spans healthcare and drug discovery, right? And obviously, uh, folks are asking questions, how can we uh, create new materials using generative techniques? And I was on this project, Generative AI, Generative Toolkit for Scientific Discovery, GT4SD, which we started uh, in 2022, early. So it was actually preceding ChatGPT substantially, right? Because GPT models, transformers were around for a bit before the ChatGPT became kind of made it super famous. Uh, and uh, our GT4SD toolkit uh, was available. It was announced at SciPy uh, 2022. It got the best open source tool for science award uh, and uh, people are using it, right? So we actually have uh, some previous work in uh, generative AI uh, kind of preceding chat GPT. So IBM has a history of uh, obviously using AI and ML for, for science. And so that that's kind of where my hats overlap. So my colleague Tim Bonneman here is at Open Source Science. So there are two of us here. And uh, we also support staff at NumFocus who have a program manager for Open Source Science 
now at NumFocus. And Tim is going to talk a little bit more about open source science later. So uh, this is just some, you know, uh, photos from community events we did. So that thing in the right top corner, this is LM of Avalanche, San Francisco. And uh, that came about, you know, obviously people want to know progress in the field of LLM. And uh, so I run multiple events uh, in San Francisco Bay Area. I started the Bay Area AI Meetup, which is now one of the most established meetups in the world in AI. We have about 5,000 members, and because we're located in the center of technology world, we get you know most recent updates from all the companies in Silicon Valley, uh, and obviously kind of became a bit dormant during the pandemic, but we came back in in the summer, and uh, we had really strong interest. You know, LLM really brings people together. And uh, when Databricks Summit happened in end of June, we are partners of Databricks. I know them since the very inception, since creation of Apache Spark, right? They started my meetup, kind of the first meetup uh, for Apache Spark. And now Databricks is a data and AI company. So we basically did this you know, local meetup preceding the summit. And we just thought, okay, so we're gonna get some people together. We're gonna get, you know, 100 people maybe, right? Get a room like this and just have a discussion, right, like we have here. Uh, and it snowballed. It just, you know, from, you know, several dozen people, it quickly went to several hundred, and then it reached a thousand people. And from a few speakers, we ended up with 40 speakers, right? And we still had four hours to do this, right? So, so I call it the biggest, deepest, uh, shortest technical conference in LMs. And the way we structured it, right, we, we kind of want to focus on interesting technical topics because a lot of discussion about chat GPT focuses on kind of sci-fi issues, ethics issues, is AI gonna kill us, is it gonna take our jobs? And I'm kind of sad, guys, okay, we know it's gonna kill us, it's gonna take our jobs, we know that, right? We want to know how, how is it gonna happen? What is it gonna do, right? So like, let's, let's kind of eschew the, uh, philosophical discussion and see if we can focus on technical topics, right? And that's especially true for the developer community. So in, in our meetups in San Francisco Bay Area, everybody is a developer, right? Developers come from hundreds of startups, developers come from all the fan companies, right? Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, almost any company has an office, like Toyota Research is there, Volkswagen Research is there. Right, Alibaba is there. Like you, you name it, they have an office in in Silicon Valley. And so and most people are either developers or data scientists or product managers. And the product managers want to know, uh, you know, how products will look like developed with AI. So uh, and basically, we decided kind of these are the themes we decided to focus on at this LLM Avalanche event in San Francisco. And obviously, you know, we have a much shorter, uh, like smaller group here, but I think that's kind of the topics we want to initially r discuss. And you guys are very welcome to, to join. I think the plan is kind of, since we have a few people here, I think people will come during the day. Maybe people come and go, we'll see, like we have more people who registered who are not here yet. So, so what I think we, we can do to make it most efficient and useful, we'll run it as a conference. So I'll start with a few topics here, right? And then we have uh, some folks who can give presentations. So Nick from uh, OSI uh, uh, will, uh, will describe open source AI. Tim will talk about open source science. And I think we also have some folks who plan to give talks. So I've seen uh, some of them reached out to me. So here, who among here wants to give a talk? if you guys want to come up here. Does anybody have a presentation besides Nick, Tim, and myself? Nobody here. So we actually have some speakers who want to come and give a talk, right? So maybe they'll come later. Uh, but, you know, even if you don't have a presentation, let's just do like a quick pulse of the room. So like, do you guys work in LLM? Who, who already works with LLMs in your workplace? And who like follows LLMs actively? Who like is in the context. Okay, so you know you don't need to kind of be 
leading practitioner, if you have a topic of interest you want us all to discuss, feel free to come up here and start a discussion, right? I think the only requirement, because we have a live stream, we have to have somebody here in the frame. <laughs> so, so, so we'll need to kind of, right, because people who join online need to be, you know, in, involved. So, so we'll, we'll figure it out. Normally, when we don't have a live stream, we'll have a small group of us just sit in a circle. So that's another option, right? Like we can actually, we can sit in a circle if you, like, if this is good, right? So like, I can be on stage and I can be in the frame and everybody can be in the circle, like a team and I, right? Like, well, let's figure it out. But let me, let me cover first, right, this, some of these topics. So I think uh, generally, so why do we have this discussion? Why do we have these meetings? So, you know, like information is falling on us every, every hour, every day. So we call it LLM avalanche because it's like an avalanche. It's an avalanche of information. It follows, falls on you and it will bury you, right? Like if you, if you don't have a strategy how to deal with this, it's just too much. Right, so, uh, and that's just inevitable. The pace of scientific discovery increased. There is a lot of labs that are cranking out papers. That started with, I think, accelerated with deep learning, right? With deep learning, you see like, the papers started coming out and it's, it's really hard to absorb the progress. And if you work in industry, like we work in IBM, you work at Huawei, like you want in a big company, you need to be on top of what's going on. And it's very difficult, right? Because there is so much stuff. So. Uh, you can go and read blogs, you can go read Twitter, you can follow OpenAI, you know, Andre Karpathy, like people generally, like we know, you know, some, some uh, interesting uh, kind of source of information we, we go to, but stuff just bursts, like recently, you know, there is this thing called Open Interpreter, who heard about Open Interpreter. September 5th, this guy from Seattle publishes Open Interpreter which is basically like OpenAI interpreter, but running local in your machine, right? And you, you can put a model locally, right? And so in one week, in one week, the project becomes number one on GitHub, full week, 20,000 stars, right? So like literally you can, you can start the movement in a week, right? And you can build a company probably, like they have a, uh, it's just some guy in Seattle, like uh, it's really interesting how this happens. Killian, uh, Lucas Killian, right? And, and uh, this is just indicative, right? Like the disruption can happen very quickly and, and that we need like all to understand what it means. So what I found running communities is that you can go and read all you want, right? But really you get, need to get together with your colleagues and the community. And then, you know, if you have a lot of people looking at this, then you really have much better idea because, you know, everybody has some piece of the puzzle. Everybody has an angle. And when you get together, right, you can establish kind of the baseline. What is the current understanding in the field? So uh, I think it's, first of all, it's important, right? Because as humans, you know, you can be like inundated with information online, but humans have a limited, you know, way to process it. So what, how decisions are made as kind of community, we decide where this field is going, right? And so kind of regardless of how much information is coming in, there is a process by which the industry moves, right? And for instance, a conference like OSS Summit is a very important checkpoint. So we'll get together, we present the state of the art, you hear like from keynote speakers, you hear from leading, you know, like uh, developers in industry, and then you understand where different players are, right? And like, in, in, if the startups can move very fast, you know, corporations move slower. It takes them a certain time to absorb and, the, and judge and decide. So I think, you know, a meeting like this is very useful, right? Because we can, com can compare notes and can compare our understanding, right? Like I see like you guys from Fujitsu, Huawei, IBM, like these companies are big, they move slower, although now they have to move faster. Like even normally it takes years, now it should take months, right? Like you have to adapt. You have to adapt the pace of change. So, so that's why I think it's very useful to have uh, a community meeting. Uh, and another point I will make is uh, related to evaluation of these models. Uh, so, so basically what do we have? We have, you know, we have data, right? So different models are trained on, 
on, on different data and generally we have an idea strained basically on everything so far available on the internet, right? And some, some um, models don't disclose the training data sets, but generally we know it's some kind of web crawl, it's some kind of stack overflow for code, it's archive.org for scientific papers. We kind of know the sources, it's Wikidata, right? We kind of know the general sources of information. Um, some of this is problematic, right? Even public data can be problematic. An example, obviously, is, you know, Enron, Enron data set. Who heard about the Enron data set? Enron emails. So Enron was a court case in the United States, right? Enron was basically an energy company which, which messed up and uh, basically went bankrupt and uh, came to court. And this is a part of, of discovery. Uh, emails from Enron were made public, right? So kind of in order to prove that Enron was at fault, uh, the discovery process made the internal emails available and they were put in the court record and became public. So now when people want to train, you know, want to understand how people in the comparison email to each other, what like, what is a company email? Like, what does it look like? What's the dynamics of internal communication? And run data set is public. So, and obviously some of the models were trained on data sets which included in run email data set. So, so when people ask some questions about, you know, company communications and so forth, they suddenly might get back emails of people at Enron, which look like private information because they have the emails, right? Names and locations. So if you're not familiar with this, if you don't know the history of this, uh, and you say a business user using one of these models and this, which actually happened, uh, you will suddenly get like private information, what you will think is private information. You will think that this model is leaking private information. And if you don't know where it's coming from, you, you may freak out because if it's leaking these emails from and wrong from some company you don't know about, maybe you think it's related, maybe my customers' emails are gonna be leaked too, right? So people actually uh, are very much surprised by this, right? If they don't know the history of this. So uh, this is just an example that you can't assume this data is safe. Oh, actually, on, in the early days of ChatGPT, a lot of people ask questions like, give me Amazon passwords, right? Give me SSH keys. Because a lot of students are careless and they check in the, like a lot of people actually, right? Like they do git commit, they check in the passwords, the files containing passwords, the file containing keys, and professors they regularly lose, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in Amazon or Azure credits because their student checked in the password and the crypto miners look for it and they grab it and before you notice they run up the bill and a lot of compute, right? So this is very typical. So a lot of the, the if, you, if you start basically slurping the whole internet, you find that a lot of data is, is, is security risk. Right, and, and you don't know until you start looking at it. So, so when we look at training data, we can't assume that it's clean, we cannot assume it's safe, right? We can assume that it is gonna hurt you. So if you are a researcher at the university, probably it will not hurt you, but if you are an enterprise and you provide an open source model uh, without making sure it's safe, it may start leaking sensitive data right? Without you knowing this. So you may be liable, right? And generally speaking, enterprises don't want to be liable, especially global enterprises. If you do business in multiple jurisdictions, you don't know what it means if this happens, right? And so the, the general stance is like to stand back. So I think a lot of this progress has been held back now because we don't know what these models are going to spill. And another question is, if the model is going to spill this data, what are you going to do about it, right? So what is the feedback loop? which will let you correct uh, and basically mitigate the security risk. So, so at IBM, we have a very good effort to, to have a lake house, right? Which is used to train our what's the next models. And um, it's, it's our colleagues at Almaden. And so they basically do a very good job by, by letting you flag issues, right? And the general approach is if you have 
documents. If you have, you know, some leakage, if you have some objectionable output, you should be able to trace it back to the training data set, right? And you should be able to trace it back and you should be able to decide you want to clean it up, you want to remove these documents and then you need to retrain, right? And the question now is, you know, training is expensive, so we need architectures which let you flag and remove uh, objectionable training data and retrain very efficiently and incrementally. So I think that like, the training itself will have to become uh, much more efficient to do this. You, you don't, you know, you shouldn't like run the full training if you remove one document or one paragraph, right? Or one string. So that's data. Models, I think most focus now is on models, right? So we basically see open source models come online. I think this is the most well understood area right now, right? And so I think the attention is focusing on models. So that's why I really think it's super important to remember it's just one piece of the puzzle. Right, the models is what make it interesting, uh, and a lot of work goes into the models. When people talk about the models, first of all, they forget about often about the, the data. Right, you don't see as much talk about the data. Like people don't even want to focus on this. They they just don't have access to the data. They don't know. Like OpenAI doesn't disclose this. Right, but the, like we need to remember this. So now we have the models, and there is a whole you know set of questions with the models. Uh, well, they have closed source models, so have open source models. Uh, the models are big, right? So you need to host them. Uh, so there is a whole set of questions, you know, how to, to run, to access these models and compare these models. Uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit, you know, more uh, next. Uh, but I think this is the most common topic, so it's best understood. Uh, now, applications, right? So applications is, I think, Currently, very little uh, talked about. Like we talk about applications, we talk about LangChain, we talk about Llama Index. So we, you know, there are basically several um, examples of applications, but uh, I've not seen an actual production deployment. Have you guys seen any production deployment of generative AI used for business? No, right? So this is kind of a very strange thing. If you think about it, right? So we have, but it was probably very early, right? So since November, December last year till today, like I mean, soon, soon it will be a year. We don't have any obvious, like world famous example of production deployment. We have a lot of talk that AI is going to replace customer service departments. It's going to replace tickets. It's going to replace Zendesk. It's going to replace call centers. Right? We don't have any clear and obvious demonstration. There are some reports, like some startups say they fire the customer service, replace it with LLMs, right? Like I don't really see that, you know, as a clear proof, right? You, you don't see that kind of uh, a recipe how to do this. And I think, you know, there are many reasons for this, right? One reason is what I described before, that generally big enterprises are very slow in terms of legal liability. They want to understand a lot of issues, right? But I think the application question will actually become the main question of the next year or two. So if you look at what LangChain folks are doing, they're basically charging ahead. Like their model is, we don't know what OpenAI is gonna do next, but we need to make these models useful today. So they basically make it easy to query the API, to interact with the model, but also you need to do a lot of things around it. So you need to work with prompts, right? And so prompt engineering is now a thing. So if you do engineering, you manage the prompts, you, you, know, you sequence the queries, you need to understand what happens, how to look at the results, filter results, evaluate results, one, you know, one shot, few shot, reasoning, uh, then obviously, you know, uh, retrieval augmented uh, generation, which became now a RAG application, is now a term, right? Uh, so, so all of this is a lot of engineering, and to me, it all looks like it's not science. It's not even software engineering. It's really like it is like software engineering, but it's really a craft, right? It's really like we, we, we find these things by trial and error, and so the practice, the practice evolves to. 
to create these patterns, you know, the best practices, right? So, so basically, LinkedIn is a collection of best practices. And if you look what they're doing, like they do prompt obfuscation, right? If you want to, if you want to put this into the enterprise, you want to safeguard your prompts. Uh, if you use if you use prompts on behalf of the user, right? You should make it easy to for an adversary or a kind of malicious actor to reverse engineer and understand how the thing is made, right? It's something there is a huge risk. Now, if you have a question answering system, it can basically reveal what other people are asking it and why, right? And you don't, in an enterprise setting, you, you have multiple customers. You don't want this to happen. So a lot of thinking is, you know, how do we make this safe? How do we make it safe in an actual real world deployment? And I think the current thinking is actually extremely ad hoc. Like people are just kind of hypothesizing what threats can be like, right? And, 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 and try to protect against them. We have some um, kind of reports of failures, right? Like at some point, ChatGPT started leaking other people's sessions, other people's questions, right? So it was the failure of the setup. But that's an example of what practitioners are safeguarding against. But generally, I think where the progress, in my mind, will happen, and you guys are very welcome to discuss this, right? It's like, it's my hypothesis. So, uh, you know, if you work with enterprise, like, you know, IBM works with large companies, you go to an enterprise, and enterprises have a lot of systems already, right? Like they have the customer service systems, they have the orders, they have their finance, they have the analytics, if they have web application, they have all kinds of observability applications, right? So now you want to replace a piece of this, and so there are humans who do all kinds of jobs. So humans do analysis of their web applications, e-commerce, humans do customer support, right? So there are humans behind a bunch of the systems. And so the idea is that you're gonna replace the humans, or augment the humans with LLMs, right? And because humans are basically looking at a sequence of events and making predictions. This is where LLMs are much better and faster, right? So, but in order to bring LLMs into the loop, you need to hook it up to all of the systems, right? So instead of just making them understand text, you need to make them understand sequence of orders, right? Or sequence of transactions, or sequence of clicks, or observability data, right? So you now have different kinds of sequential data. And all of these systems currently are a bunch of legacy stuff, even if they're open source, right? There's basically a bunch of existing, pretty unwieldy, bespoke, even open source, you know, if they're open source at the beginning, they'll become kind of a bunch of craft and accretion on top of this. And if they work in an enterprise, they talk to Salesforce, they talk to Oracle, right? Like there's a whole bunch of integrations. So enterprise is a giant blob of software integrated with kind of bespoke scripts. And it runs on some kind of infrastructure. It may be Kubernetes, it may be on-prem, but like you have a very complex system now you want to bring LLMs into the system, you need to understand, right, if it's, you know, a service, right? You have microservice architecture, you need to integrate the service into all these other services. But you want this, your service wants now to run a lot of them, right? It wants to make decisions. So, so I think what we'll see in the next year, people actually struggling with that. It will be much harder than producing marketing copy. Right? It will be much harder than generating text. And um, again, like if you make automatic prediction of what you should do with enterprise systems, you need much better control and validation, right? Like you need to understand the risk. If your action is automatic, right, you need to be very sure that this action is correct. And if you have doubts, then you need to have a process where you put it in front of humans or second level of review. So human in the loop architectures will be very interesting. Uh, and I think I really don't see anybody yet who thinks about this properly. Like, like there is no thinking of how do you integrate the systems into enterprise, right? At least presented publicly, right? And so when, you know, remember we, we had digital transformation for a decade. So I think the digital transformation which we, we talked about was in infancy, it was a toy 
in transformation compared to what is coming, right? Because the digital transformation of 10 years ago was digitization of the enterprise, right? Like, how do you put records into databases? How do you put transactions and so forth? Like, this is all more or less solved. But I think from the standpoint of the future, this is just the preliminary step. Now, if you really want to disrupt the enterprise, the digital transformation 2.0 will be taking a lot of human decisions can, which can be automated, right? So a lot of low level activity can be replaced like customer service lookup of documentation. But also if you look at middle management, middle management are basically human routers, right? They're, they're basically routing strategy into implementation. And if the implementation becomes automated, the middle management function as a router becomes obsolete, right? Because instead of controlling several humans doing busy work of bureaucracy, you replace them with LLMs so they can do something more interesting. So the humans become kind of elevated, right? They need to kind of look at more interesting cases which require human review. So the managers probably will have much fewer and much more different humans, right? So I think the actual digital transformation will take whole parts of the enterprise, which have computer systems and management and humans kind of doing repetitive tasks. And that will transform this whole thing, right? With much fewer humans doing much better high level work, right? And models doing most of this. And in kind of risky cases, the decisions will percolate for human review and the human review should become much better. So that brings me to this fourth point, right? Community validation. So all of these questions, is LLM, are LLM safe? Uh, also, are they performant? Uh, do they do what you want? Can I trust them, right? Can I follow their recommendations? All of these questions cannot be decided, what I suggest, by fiat. You cannot be IBM or Huawei or Facebook and say, my model is safe, my model is performant, and my model is the best best for business, right? You cannot say it as a company. Not, no, no single company can say this because it's, it's a unilateral claim which, you know, like you cannot take anybody's word for this, right? Because if it goes and spills the data, puts you at risk, you cannot trust it. So what, what we should do as a community, we should actually develop methods to validate all these claims. And so this happens, happened previously with um, machine learning performance. So how many of here are familiar with ML Commons? ML Commons? So ML Commons is a community organization, also a nonprofit, which runs MLPerf benchmark. So it was set up around MLPerf. And so MLPerf is a benchmark to measure performance of machine learning infrastructure and applications. And so generally it was put together because different cloud providers started saying like, my cloud is the best for machine learning, right? So Amazon, Azure, Google will say like, come to us run your deep learning here, right? And as an industry, you know, you cannot compete without kind of putting together some measures, some measurable benchmarks. So they came together, developed MLPerf benchmark, and ML Commons is an umbrella nonprofit which hosts MLPerf. So now, you know, you can together, so on the board of MLPerf, they have all of these cloud providers, right? All like and Huawei and Alibaba and IBM and Google, and NVIDIA and so forth. Everybody who makes chips and everybody who, who runs clusters uh, generally is there. So now you can come together, you can agree this is a technical way to compare these claims and you can run them right on your cloud. And obviously you need to have a control environment, you need to understand exactly what your CPU, GPU is, what your bandwidth is. Like you need to know exactly what you have, right? And then you can compare. So the industry solved it, more or less, for hardware and software stack running deep learning. So probably in the similar fashion, we can do benchmarks for the labs, right? So when it comes to performance, we probably can come up with similar things and people already do. However, the questions of trust and security are much harder, right? Also, the trust is a very sensitive issue because what model can say about the world can affect you. And obviously what's acceptable to say in the US and China is different or Canada or 
Spain. So in, if you start querying the model for general world knowledge, or if it starts making opinions, like you may actually find that you need to be sensitive to what's kind of acceptable and legal in the jurisdictions where you run their, your operations, right? So this is why it's hard. Uh, it's, the topic is, is, is difficult to kind of quantify. So, you know, one way to attack it is basically restrict the scope to business problems at hand, right? You don't want to talk to the model about philosophy. You want to talk to the model about orders and deliverables and customer satisfaction, right? But currently the models are all encompassing, right? They're comprehensive. So, so some directions of research are saying like we don't need we don't need chat GPT, right, to, for customer service. We need smaller specialized models. So something like they call SSMs, small specialized models. So, you know, every factory will have a model instead of, you know, conveyor robot assembling cars does not need to know about history. It needs to know about cars, right? So, so again, uh, the point is trust and uh, security of models depends on the scope of the models. Right, and also depends on the context. Trust is not an abstract question. Trust defined by the society and the legal area where you're located. So trust is basically a two-sided market. But the provider cannot operate without the consumer. You need to understand who consumer is, and the trust is defined in this two-market, two-sided market application. So, so I think the community validation is extremely important, uh, and. Community validation will be done by people like here meeting together and deciding what's working and what, what's, what doesn't, right? Uh, so I think that's, um, that's why we really want to have a very strong community around this. And so I think as Linux Foundation, we need to have, um, we need to have a uh, standing community for, for generative AI. And I think this is what is going on, like at LFAI and uh, foundation, this, there is a concerted effort in this direction. <clears throat> so, so I think this, uh, in this uh, summit, we will see some substantial progress in this space. Okay, so I talked about that. Uh, yeah, so this is what I talked about earlier. Why, you know, how we did this in SF and what we're gonna do here. And so, yeah, so this is kind of the, I think that's all I have, like the plan is uh, kind of, this are the topics, right? So I kind of put some points in the landscape just to start the discussion. I hope you guys, uh, you know, see this kind of as a frame, but maybe there are a few of us here, maybe, you know, maybe we can do some introductions. Maybe, you know, everybody can spend like a couple of minutes, you know, uh, and say, why are you interested in LLMs? What do you want to see today? If you want to spend the whole day here, like a part of the day, what do you want us to do? It's basically up to us. Like we have a few talks, you know, by folks who are here. Maybe we have, we have more talks, but generally, maybe let's let's do an introduction, like round of introductions, and um, and see what you know what we want to achieve today. So I think I already have done a lot. So maybe Tim will go next. Uh, yeah, we have the mic. Yeah, let me let me give the mic to Tim. And Tim bring, will bring the mic to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is David Lai from Huawei, Canada. I'm uh, in the platform engineering team and doing the ecosystem development. Today, I'm trying to see uh, how does the community uh, maturity into this new area. Uh, larger language model. Um, the reason I'm interested in is that I think this will change the, the way uh, software is developed. So since uh, my team basically is doing the tools, uh, you know, software tool to help a uh, company to develop the software, right? So I think LM, uh, particularly the gene, uh, this uh, chat, uh, uh, GDP already demonstrate the capability able to generate code and things like that and explain the code. So I'm trying to see how this is going to impact to the uh, software engineering process and, and maybe or beyond that. 
So, and hopefully, I mean, um, well, I can learn more on today. Thank you. Hello, folks. So my name is Nick Vidal. I work with the Open Source Initiative. Uh, this is a nonprofit that coined the term uh, open source 25 years ago. There has been a lot of talk about open source AI, but there's no clear definition of what exactly is that. And the OSI is bringing together several members uh, from around the world to try to uh, come up with a clear definition of what's actually open source AI. Thank you. And maybe you can give an update on that later, because I know you've been meeting with a lot of people, right, over the last few months exactly. to make progress on that. That'd be very interesting to hear. Who'd like to go next? Can I ask you to? Sure. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Hiro Kobashi from Fujitsu. And uh, yes, we are here is to uh, collect our data about a uh, uh, large language model. You know, the, as you said, the company is very, very looking forward to utilizing the LLM, but there is not much open source project in there. So how can we utilize such a project is the, one of the, our big target. So I would like to get some more information about it. That, that's the reason we are here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, John Gorostiola from General Electric. Uh, in our department, we started, we are interested in uh, uh, developing some AI. Actually, I'm interested of any kind of AI, but our main application of a more practical application would be a chat, and that's why uh, here in the uh, large, language, uh, large language model part, uh, that's why I'm here. And I want to, learn more. Uh, it's, uh, I am in uh, uh, initiation part of the AI uh, uh, learning, but I wanted to figure out uh, with this, uh, just learning a little, bit, a little bit more and how to approach uh, the application we want to develop, maybe an LLM or SSM as you mentioned. So that's, uh, that was my, my aim. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Carlos Clemente here from ExpressVPN. So I work in the in the platform team or uh, developer experience, kind of a um, same thing. We try to, to to develop an internal platform right now for our developers. And as a LLM user myself, I want to use or I want to find out how can I help internally our developers to um, well overcome some of the of the issues sometimes could be documentation that they not they don't find and obviously you, you cannot go and ask chat gpt that because that's specifically on how how do we run or how do, how do we build stuff internally so i think it could also be easy for some new members of the team to get trained uh, because all this documentation right but sometimes it's difficult and people uh waste time trying to find where where uh, everything is there, or like if, even in the team, um, every team may have different standards or ways to uh, write the computation, for example. So I think LLMs can help with that gap uh, internally in a team. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Bonneman. I am the community lead for open source science. Uh, it's a new initiative, as Alexi mentioned, that was launched last year to uh, accelerate science by improving the way open source software gets done in science. And uh, one thing I'm particularly interested in, um, we're starting out with uh, three domains, um, namely uh, chemistry, material science, uh, healthcare, life sciences, and climate and sustainability. And there's a lot of uh, experimentation going on uh, using LLMs to, as Alex mentioned, you know, exploring new materials or new drugs. And uh, coming up with better ways to do science by having these uh, LMs suggest, you know, targets uh, for exploration um, or hints for how to study materials or these processes. So, um, and of course, the people that we engage with are very committed to using open source tooling. So we're interested in what open source landscape could look like for scientists specifically with regard to LMs. Anyone else? Um, 
Uh, my name is Christine Abernathy, and I uh, represent F5. And uh, what I'm interested in is learning a little bit more about um, open source LLMs, especially issues around copyright. That's not really specific to open source. But um, also thinking about, to your point, what is open source AI licensing? What does it mean? So that, that's one interest point as well. And also kind of learning a little bit more about like the security aspects and what is specific to open source. What's different about security with LLMs, uh, which open source versus just proprietary. So just thinking about those types of topics. Excellent, thank you. Alexi, did you want, did we have everyone? Yeah. Um, did you want to go over logistics, like lunch break or? Oh yeah, let's, let's do that. So I have this right here. So uh, basically the plan was, right, um, I mean, generally, we have few people, so we're not going to have breakout sessions, right? Uh, we're going to just stay, you know, as a team and discuss this. So I think we have, you know, a couple talks, you know, from Nick about uh, open source AI. And I think it's a very useful discussion. So we can have, you know, Nick's talk and main discussion following this. <coughs> then Tim will talk about open source science is an application area where LLMs can make a difference. Uh, Right, and uh, we'll see then, you know, what follows, right? So I think the current plan is to have lunch break at 1 p.m. in two hours, one to two, and then reconvene here, if that works. And just in case there is coffee and water and some little snacks on the terrace, right? So so we have, I think, some stuff to go on. So yeah, let's, let's probably do this. Like, let's run through lunch, right? and find a good point to break for lunch around 1 p.m. And then we'll see, I think some people are gonna come, like a lot of people actually registered who are not here yet. So they're probably coming in later through the day. I know for sure some people are gonna join after lunch. So we can reassess right after lunch. Okay, cool. So Nick, you have your laptop, right? Like it's, a, okay, let me.